Hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have a, a room that is completely full. Welcome to our session, Open Data, Better Cities, Learning from the Global South. I'm happy to co-host that session with Taylor. Um, Taylor uh, will do the presentation of uh, themselves right after. Really quickly, um, so I'm Elizabeth, the Deputy Executive Director at Mobility Data and Head of Growth. I'm based here in Montreal. Um, I'm someone that is looking forward into um, how can we build an equitable vision of mobility, but also towards uh, carbon neutral. I speak French, English, and Spanish. I will introduce you here to our all. This is our 360 camera. We have a session with um, international attendees that are remote. I will uh, present them to you right after. So first of all, the agenda, we have a two-in-one session, lucky you. Uh, I'll do a very quick introduction. Then we have a session about GTFS and access to destinations. Right after, our second session is about collaborative mapping and equity. And obviously, this is um, a collaborative process. Please ask questions. Um, it's a discussion also. Please don't hesitate. That's the session overview, so it's time to get started. Taylor? So, my name is Taylor. I use they, them, gender neutral pronouns. I'm here today from Washington, D.C., where I work with ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Uh, ITDP is an international NGO dedicated to sustainable and inclusive urban mobility, especially in low and middle income countries around the world. We've been around since 1985, um, and we have regional offices in, I believe, 10 countries around the world, so everywhere from Mexico City to Jakarta. Um, you'll be hearing today from two um, of my colleagues in our regional offices, and you'll also be hearing from five people who are really leading the field forward of mobility data, open data in the Global South. Because this is the International Mobility Data Summit. This is not the North America and Western Europe <laughs> Mobility Data Summit. Um, and so, you know, I'm really glad that all of you have chosen to join this session. Uh, think about the rest of the world. Think about the world where the majority of people live, where the majority of trips are by informal transport, um, and where the majority of growth, the vast majority, will be happening over the next several decades. Um, the world where more people will be hurt by the effects of climate change and the world where it is so much more important for us to, to do all we can to use mobility data to, to support better transport, better planning, better cities. Um, so as Elizabeth said, we'll be having two sort of mini sessions within the larger session today. Uh, the first will be about um, GTFS, transit data, and the measurement of access to destinations. We'll be hearing from three speakers in this first mini session, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and conversation. Uh, these speakers will first be um, Abdulrahman Malegi from Transport for Cairo, which is a, a small group really leading the field in the gathering and use of GTFS data for informal transport, among many other things. Uh, then we will hear from my colleague Santiago Fernandez in ITDP's Mexico City office. And finally, from Daniel Herzenschut, who is affiliated with, the, with IPEA, which is a Brazilian sort of federal economic policy think tank. Um, and they're working on some very powerful and exciting tools for f working with GTFS data, as well as analyzing it into useful access to destinations metrics. Um, thank you all so much. Um, my name is Mamidiki. I work as a, as a process manager with the uh, uh, Taylor already uh, used the TFC tool we were founded in 2015 with the vision to improve mobility in Egypt, but then we moved to other uh, African cities as well. 
Um, the topic of my uh, uh, small talk is going to be about overcoming data scarcity. And I'll uh, take two examples from two projects we've worked on in Cairo and Casablanca. So um, let's, talk, uh, let's talk first about Casablanca. Uh, what did we want to do in this particular project? We wanted to build what we call a spatial employment model. Um, so uh, basically, we want to see the number of jobs within a granular uh, spatial unit, geographic unit, in the city of Casablanca in Morocco. So uh, how did we achieve that? Uh, we had like four main tasks to do. Um, first, we had to get the administrative boundaries in spatial format to be our study area. Then we had to access data. So uh, this is the main topic of this talk, is that how um, challenging it is to, to access data and to access accurate data, and how we can get it from um, like the workarounds we go to uh, in order to get this data. So in this particular case, we access the data from uh, Google, Google Maps, from OpenStreetMaps, and from something called Kirix. Kirix is like the local um, kind of like a job portal uh, in Morocco. Uh, so we have three different sources that are not connected to each other in any way. Then we did some data cleaning and lastly we uh, did the assigning of the number of jobs to the uh, points, the geographic points where the uh, places of employment uh, were. So in terms of data cleaning, uh, how do we do that? So we uh, get, we scrape all this data from all these different sources. Now, uh, this employment data are all geographic spatial points. So they have coordinates, that's good. Uh, that's very granular, but they have what we call raw categories. So each point has like a definition, like a hotel, a spa, uh, a restaurant, whatever. So we had about 343 different row categories from these uh, scraped data sources. We standardized them based on uh, the labor force survey into 22. So this is a step that we have to do and uh, that takes a little bit of uh, intuition to go down from 343 to 22. Then we remove the duplicates in this data. Obviously, when we scrape data from multiple sources, there are going to be duplicates. So how do we do that? We rely on the spatial proximity. Um, so we take each separate data set, so let's say Google, and then we say, okay, uh, if uh, two points are within, let's say 25 meters from each other and they have the same category, they are both uh, schools, uh, then most likely they are uh, duplicate points because you have some points entered in Arabic, some points entered in English and so on. And then we look at the whole data set, the combined data, we do another filtration based on proximity and name similarities. So we do uh, something like called regular expression, come up with uh, similarity in names, along with proximity to uh, remove the duplicate points. Of course, this is, uh, this is done on scale. Lastly, we rely on uh, the existing data, and this is the case where the existing data helps, uh, the less granular existing data. So we have data on the, let's say, the scale of a district. Not, not a point. And this district, government says, has uh, this number of jobs for this particular job category. So we map our job categories to the points and distribute uh, the jobs onto the points accordingly to come up with a more granular distribution of uh, employment. Of course, there are uh, more. There is more complexity to this, but uh, as the time allows us to um, explain this very briefly. So this is a quick equation on how we come up with uh, the number of jobs at each point. So again, it's based on job categories, it's based on uh, land area classification, whether it's rural or urban, because this is how the government uh, classified it, particular case. And we look at the total number of jobs for employment categories and other, other factors. So at the end, we come up with um, this, this, uh, this visual where we have number of jobs per uh, hexagon. This is one example. I wanted also to talk about uh, Cairo, a completely different project that was actually earlier in 2018. And we wanted to measure accessibility uh, to jobs 
with public transport. Now, as my other colleagues will be talking, um, this is this is a standard exercise that's being done uh, uh, in a lot of other cities in different contexts. But I want to talk about the challenges more. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, like accessibility with public transport, we're talking about uh, the data sets that are needed. We need to have route uh, like GIS, the uh, geographic data for the routes. And we have to have something called the GTFS, which is a data format that combines both the uh, spatial and the temporal data. And we have to have data on population and again, job opportunities. So in Egypt's case, we had to create each data set uh, uh, for, 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 for this exercise to be uh, attainable. First of all, we had to digitize Cairo's public transport. There was no information at all on the public transportation system. Uh, the most information you can get is from the main stations. You'll find it painted on the walls that uh, this bus goes to this uh, location. And of course, it's origin destination only, and it's outdated. So we had to create our own software suite, which, called, uh, which is called Root Lab to manually assign field researchers to go to the field and collect this data and get uh, boarding and alighting data and uh, route itinerary and all, uh, all of that in order to uh, be able to have GIS and temporal data uh, on the public transport network. And after that, we needed to, again, create the job opportunities data. In this case, we relied on many NGOs that were operating in Egypt. We relied on Google Maps. We relied on the, something called Yellow Pages, you know Yellow Pages, but uh, it's the local version here. Uh, we had to, again, um, map categories and do some data cleaning, which is the, uh, the, the, the one with the, you know, uh, the headache. And then we come up with the opportunities data set. So you, um, you do all these workarounds and all these approximations, arrive at uh, again, uh, a granular spatial unit, which in this case are the hexagons, that has accessibility measures, uh, that has the number of jobs of the within each hexagon, that has the number of people living within each uh, hexagon. So, um, what's what's the conclusion here? Um, in order to come up with uh, accurate data analysis uh, in the African context, I would say. Uh, you have to create, manually uh, create a lot of your data and you have to innovate your own uh, workarounds. Uh, but that also means that you have to be extra careful in each step because some of these steps are, uh, there are novel, uh, you know, improvisations. So you have to be uh, careful at each step that uh, what we're doing is actually not deviating away from uh, reality. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I leave the floor back to you, Taylor and Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Abdurrahman, for joining. Um, I noticed that Mohammed Hagazi has also joined us, um, if just for a few minutes. And Hagazi, I wonder if you would like to say a few words, um, as well as Abdurrahman, to our audience here at the Mobility Data Summit in Montreal. Hi, everybody. I'm Santiago Fernandez. Um, I work at the ITP Mexico office. And I was waiting for Taylor to maybe give me the green light, but since I was next in line, maybe I can start unless anybody wants to say something um, before that. Okay, then I'll just go ahead then. Well, great to meet you, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for inviting me to this panel. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, build a little bit on what Abdel Raham was mentioning and what he was talking about, which is um, the topic that brought us here today, which is accessibility and GTFS and the tools that allow us to, to to measure accessibility uh, thanks to these data sets that are now becoming increasingly available. So I'm gonna do a very quick presentation. I'm gonna maybe take a step back, talk about why it's important to measure, to measure accessibility, what is exactly what we're talking about, some applications that we're working on in the ITDP Mexico office, and um, finally, um, some tools that we can use to measure it. So, well, what is accessibility? I want to propose these two definitions for you. One is the ability to reach opportunities that are scattered in space. And the other one is the potential for interaction. So as you can see, this, this concept has been around for many decades now, but it's only beginning to get traction within the planning community. So if we think about it as a potential and an ability is related to many of our personal characteristics, 
the transport uh, infrastructure, where things are actually located, and the time we have we have available, all these things, these things will um, play a role in allowing us to reach a given destination that we want to. Um, we think this concept is useful because if we start thinking about how planners and um, transportation engineers were thinking about uh, transportation infrastructure in the past, it was very, we could say it was somewhat limited, no? And within, for decades, we, we thought about um, transport policy as just uh, speed and capacity. We are very familiar with that, with the impacts that it had on our cities. We are starting to, started to build highways and more um, infrastructure without really thinking where people were going to. You know? we, were, we were concerned about moving things faster and faster um, and moving more vehicles and more vehicles. Then we could say came a shift, um, perhaps like a couple of decades ago, uh, when people started to think about mobility, saying, hey, we don't want to move vehicles, we want to move people. So that opened up our poly public policy application because we started thinking about other modes, walking, biking, um, which um, led to better outcomes. But that maybe was still limited because we're thinking about mobility, we're assuming people want to move, but uh, people want sometimes, I mean, some people, maybe people that have that drive motorcycles or, or definitely the people that like riding a bike like to move, but usually people are trying to access things. So this is the new, a new paradigm perhaps of planning because it allows us to think about uh, not only how people are moving, but also where things are located and think about it in a more comprehensive and cohesive way. Um, why measure it? I mean, one reason is that it allows us to bridge different policy um, policy dimensions. Um, for example, usually people concerned with transport policy, as I was mentioning, they're only concerned about transport or moving people or the transport infrastructure. On another side, there's people working on social policy, working on how to make our society more inclusive, uh, how to make things more equitable. And on the other side, we have spatial planners uh, deciding where things would be located. So accessibility is a concept that allows us to bridge these different policy areas and align them um, perhaps to reach better, better, better outcomes. So accessibility thankfully can be measured in a very simple way. One way is through cumulative opportunity indicators. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this concept, it's a very simple one. It's just uh, counting how many things I can reach within a given travel time. If you look at this image at the right, it's like this person can reach this set of opportunities walking, but perhaps if this person rode a bike, uh, naturally traveling the same time, let's say 15 minutes, uh, this person would be able to reach these more um, points in space. So we just add them up and we call it an indicator. So it's, as you can see, it's very simple. Of course, that means it has limitations. Why 10 minutes, why 15 minutes? Uh, what's the value of reaching two schools if I only want to go to one? But still, um, if we take all those limitations into account, it's still a very useful concept to to use. Um, and because of that, we are seeing that uh, some cities are beginning to apply accessibility principles into their planning policies. Uh, notably, uh, I would say um, Singapore recently, then um, Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, they started to, to, to insert some accessibility indicators into their plans. They started talking about 20 minute cities, uh, 49 minute cities like Singapore. And that meant that within 20 minutes walking or by, or by biking, you would be able to reach all um, you know, basic uh, services and necessities uh, from your home. Um, Paris uh, made headlines because Paris is always, uh, it's, it's, it's a very famous city. Uh, they really made headlines with their 15 minutes concept. Um, and they decidedly said that they were trying to become a city where everybody would be able to reach their basic necessities within 15 minutes. But uh, to us as an organization working in the global south, the question is um, what's happening in our countries? Do we, are we seeing this shift as well? We're definitely lagging back a little bit, but we are seeing some progress. And one uh, example that I want to talk to you about is um, um, a project that we were involved in recently in Mexico. Mexico for us, uh, for those that haven't been here recently, has had a um, very explosive urban growth in the last decades, thanks mostly because of a social housing policy that privileged uh, increasing the number of housing. So that meant that um, millions of housing units were built, but very far away from cities with very little consider consideration to accessibility. The image that you see is actually a new development, but it's just like in the middle of nowhere. 
Um, not considering accessibility, according to experts and authorities, led to at least uh, led, led to many a myriad of problems. With one being a very serious problem of housing abandonment. In some areas, 70% of the houses are abandoned, and that had a lot to do with the fact that houses were not accessible. So we worked last year with the Institute in Fonavit, which is the main housing lender in Mexico, to develop a set of criteria, of access criteria, in which uh, housing um, developers and those that are uh, seeking access to credit would need uh, to fulfill just to be able to access the finance, housing finance. So this just came into effect this month. Uh, we'll see what the progress is. But just to show you an example that the countries in the global south are also starting to look at this concept and um, thinking about innovative ways in which they can adapt it to, to our own contexts. Um, and just to close down um, very quickly with some of the tools and trying to know, not to overlap a lot with what my colleagues will be presenting, I just want to show you very quickly some of the tools that we're working on in the ITDP Mexico office to actually measure uh, this type of indicators. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is that now we are in a very interesting place because there's um, more data than we ever have. Um, we have very good uh, and increasingly good uh, transportation data on, um, and that's, and luckily it's also open. No, that's a, that's a, an important, an important thing. So the first one, which is one, <laughs> the one that's on the, that we are going to focus on in this panel is GTFS. GTFS is a very useful data set that, that allows us to, to map uh, transit system data. Uh, but there's also, it needs to be connected with other sources such as uh, street work data, network data that we can get from OpenStreetMap. There's also traffic data uh, from companies such as Waze, or uh, there's many, I don't want to like, make a commercial, but just to say that there's many options. And there's also many uh, new open source software, such as um, Python tools, R tools, and a very famous one called Open Tree Planner, which I think uh, Daniel is going to focus on. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you what we're working with that. This is the first tool that we did in Mexico City some years ago. It's an isochrome based tool that we work on with Python. So it just very quickly allows us to put a point on the map, um, an isochrome appears, and it adds up all the opportunities that are around you. So then we started thinking about congestion. This is our second iteration. In this tool, we, we, we were very concerned about the fact that uh, congestion is uh, uh, like we usually assume that cars give us the greatest accessibility, but it's not really that the fact when you take into account congestion. So we, uh, we talked with Waze, a um, uh, congestion data provider, and we found that, yeah, that our intuition was correct. You know, at, at the peak hour traveling from the city center, um, accessibility is re greatly reduced uh, because of congestion. And if you, if you look at all of the modes, such as biking or public transport, it was even less so. You know? So what, that allows us to show that. And this is our last tool, just to give you a very quick view. Uh, now we are um, doing something a little bit more interactive that you can access online and um, you can choose uh, within many cities. And the idea is that it's more interactive. It allows us to put uh, several visualizations in the same place, such as regional visualizations of access, or also some isochrones, um, just allow the user to click through and think about uh, perhaps their home, you know, what are, what are the opportunities around it? Um, yeah, so this is how it looks like. This is the, um, the, the panel with different travel modes. This is a nice upgrown by biking from our office, just to give you a sense. And we're also adding some other functionalities to make it more useful, such as uh, comparing different modes or also comparing different scenarios of transport, perhaps a new line. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, thanks a lot. I just wanted to close up with some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, which is mostly state availability. Even if GTFS is very easy to develop and, and, to, and to share, and it's a standard that it's now very universal, many cities are still reluctant to, to produce it, perhaps many times due to ignorance, sometimes due to the lack of technical capacities. So that's something that we need to, that, that we need to think about. And thanks a lot. Um, I leave the floor to Daniel. Thank you so much, Santiago. Um, and thank you also, Abdulrahman. Um, I think we'll have one last um, short talk in this session, and that's from Daniel Herzenschutt at IPEA. Cool. Thanks, Taylor and Elizabeth. So, hi, my name is uh, Daniel. I'm a research assistant at IPEA, which is the Institute for Applied Economic Research in Brazil. 
And today I'm going to talk about to you about some open source tools for accessibility modeling. And more specifically, I'm going to talk about some open source tools we at IPEA have been developing uh, in the context of the Access to Opportunities Project, the AOP. So first, a bit of context on the AOP. It's a project in which we conduct annual estimates of accessibility to jobs, healthcare facilities, and education by several transport modes in Brazil's 20 largest cities. Uh, we try as much as possible to use open data and to publicly share the data we generate, the code we use, and some interactive visualizations as well on our results. And the main goal of the, of the project is to inform policy planning and evaluation. And as Santiago mentioned, trying to, to use accessibility uh, more often as a tool for urban planning in Brazil, which is gaining some traction, but not yet uh, as widely used as we'd like to. Uh, we have conducted analysis from the years to, from 2017 to 2019 due to data availability, because we don't have data up until these points. And we have generated accessibility estimates for walk, bike, public transit, uh, public transport, and car, which is a fairly recent addition to the project. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, we, can, we are not only able to generate uh, public transport estimates for nine of these 20 cities, because these are the only cities that have um, GTFS feeds with reasonably good quality, which we can use to in our estimates. Uh, the easiest way right now to download the data we generate and use is through the AOP data, uh, our package we develop. Uh, you can not only download the data we generate, the accessibility results of seven different measures, but also the social demographic data and the land use data we use that comes from very different sources, like official sources of many kinds, but we re-aggregate it to our uh, spatial grid to, so we can use in a cohesive way. And very soon we will release a REST API as well. Uh, so the access to these data is easier on different settings, not only in, in our environment. Well, the, the main, not, not sure if the main, but the, some of the key challenges we face in the project regard transport routing and GTFS validation and manipulation. And because of that, we ended up uh, developing our own set of tools to try to overcome, at least mitigate these challenges. Uh, first is R5R, which is an R package that is actually, actually an R wrapper to convey those R5 uh, routing engine, which is very fast and works on multimodal transport networks. And it contains lots of uh, different features. You can generate travel time matrices. You can do trip planning uh, detailed per trip leg. Uh, you can also estimate accessibility, uh, diff several different accessibility measures. And very soon, in the coming weeks, hopefully, uh, we will release a R5R V1 that includes a fair calculator that uses uh, the built-in uh, fair calculator capabilities from R5, but we actually tailor for our purposes uh, so we can uh, easily um, you use it to, to calculate fares in a Brazilian setting. Uh, not, it's not yet uh, as easily gener generalizable to other uh, fare policies, but we are, uh, we are sharing it right now because I think we think it's going to be useful uh, even in, in the early stages to some people. And, and as I mentioned, like we first developed our 5R to improve our own workflow. Uh, in the in our project, like we, we previously had had been had been using Open Trip Planner uh, scripting with the with Jiton, but it it was very time consuming, like resource consuming for us. Like São Paulo, which is the biggest city in Brazil and the most definitely the most uh, complex transport network of all of them, it would take around like thirty hours, much more than a day to generate a full set of uh, matrices that we, we would need. And using our 5R, it takes around like one or two hours. So it vastly improved our workflow, reduced the 
resources we need and increase our capacity of iterate through different parameters to check if the matrices are right, if they are not. Uh, we ended up uh, releasing a paper on it and a, a very good sign for us that people had have been finding these uh, this package useful for them is that the paper like which was released was published on March last year already has 24 citations. And I know like citation, citations are not everything, but they are a good sign that people have been finding the, the tool useful for them in their research and planning and everything. So it's, it's, it's very exciting for us that this is going on. And another tool we have been developing uh, in the, is GTFS tools, another R package. We use to analyze and, and manipulate GTFS feeds. And, and mainly, again, in the context of the, the feeds we have to use uh, in the project, we face a few problems. Sometimes we cannot parse it correctly. Sometimes they have very fast or very slow trips or stops there, there are misplaced or something like that. So we try to include a few tools to to make our analysis and manipulation a bit easier. So we include some spatial visualization uh, functions for so we can check uh, the stops, shapes, or the trips, whatever. We can calculate the distances, the, the length, the duration of trips. We can set average speeds. Uh, we can filter the feeds to keep on a few specific routes or agencies, trips, uh, trips that run through specific times of the day or day, days of the week that run within or outside a spatial extent. And it also includes several different uh, utility functions so we can convert frequency-based trips to stop times, remove duplicate entries, merge feeds, and many, and many others as well. Uh, I included here two links for the, for the Vignet, which are articles describing how to use the tool. And on the right, I'm sharing like just uh, how you could, for example, use a polygon to create a filter for your GTFS to keep on the filters that are contained within this polygon or they're outside of it or they run through it. So you have several uh, different options for that. So moving forward uh, with the AOP project, project as a whole, we, we, keep to, we plan to, to keep using it for assessing transport interventions, housing policies, and Uber planning policies uh, more generally. We have an exciting new project with Uber coming soon, like uh, we might be publishing uh, something with it by the end of the year, and we, in which we investigate how ride sharing apps uh, impact accessibility, especially, especially in the Brazilian context. Uh, in R5R, we, as I mentioned, we have a very big uh, release on the coming weeks, but on the, like, the future, we plan to support different fair policies that, like, for example, zone based, that are not yet uh, covered by any Brazilian policy, so we didn't uh, we didn't look at it. And GTFS tools, we would like to in improve the interoperability between the package and other GTFS packages, uh, our packages, so GTFS router, IT Transit, GTFS to GPS, and we also would like to start uh, validating GTFS feeds based on mobility data, uh, GTFS validator, uh, which would be a huge plus for us in our project as well. So that's it, that's what I had to show you, thank you. And AOP is a, a work of many people, I'm just one of them and I include all their names here again. So cheers, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you to, to everyone who just spoke. Um, I noticed, I th yes, sorry. Um, and thank you to the audience as well. Um, so I think we'll have a few minutes now um, maybe about 10 minutes for questions um, from the audience. If anybody has anything they'd like to, to ask or, or comment on, I can pass you this microphone. Hi, um, my name is uh, Omar Juma. I'm, uh, I wear two hats. One is I'm a partnerships manager at New Cities Foundation, which is a global nonprofit based in Montreal around making our cities better. The second one is a community effort around accessibility in metro systems. And uh, this is approaching it from both ends that, you know, we talked about accessing opportunities, 
but I didn't see the intersection of universal accessibility in a lot of the content that was presented. So in terms of uh, people on wheelchairs, people with mobility concerns, parents with strollers, you know, how, how are we looking at opportunities from their perspectives? How do they access the rest of the city? Absolutely. Well, I can, I can say something, and I'm sure maybe it's something Daniel has also thought about. But the truth is that you can, um, with UTFS, um, somewhat easily um, insert universal accessibility requirements to the routing. Uh, GTFS allows you to, um, for example, say if a station is uh, universally accessible, whether a uh, bus service or, or a rail service allows, um, you know, it's universally accessible for wheelchairs or different types of um, the limitations in mobility. So this is something we've tried to do. Um, we've tried to we have some pilots of, uh, of modifying the GTFS. Sadly, the GTFS in the state of, of of Mexico City does not have that information yet. We're trying to, to improve it, but it, it's a very interesting thing to analyze. It's, we're very, very interested in how, in that, because as, as just mentioned, it, um, access, uh, the question is access for whom? And if we're not able to actually to improve those indicators and actually say whether they are reachable by everybody, then, you know, then what are we really talking about? I'd like to add something. Thank you, Santiago. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? My name is Omar. I work with Mobility Data. My question is to Abdurrahman. You mentioned that in the Casablanca project, there were three data sets. Uh, I think it was Google Maps. The second was something about transit. And the third was uh, a local job uh, kind of data set. Can you elaborate more on that as a data source? Yes. So, uh, for example, in Egypt, we rely on yellow pages. That's an index for um, uh, places uh, that provide jobs. So, for example, restaurants, hotels, uh, shopping malls, and, and, and so on. Uh, we apply like uh, web scraping, uh, like software script, to uh, get these uh, features, these points and uh, basically download from the web page, uh, the web page of, in this particular case, yellow pages. In Casablanca, there were no yellow pages. There was something else, another um, website, another tool that they use, which uh, is called Kerex. And it's the same concept. It's an index that has uh, geotagged uh, locations of uh, places of work, basically. And uh, the idea is you get the name of this place, you get the location, and most importantly, you get the category. So is it recreational? Is it, uh, is it a factory? Is it uh, you know, a government office and so on? And uh, once you have this uh, spatial data set, start applying the rest of the data cleaning process to it. But case by case uh, process really. Thank you, Abdullahman. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes. So the question, the question, Abdullahman, to follow up is: How do you estimate the size of the employer? How many jobs are at a particular location? So we rely mainly on the category of the of the point of the place, but also we relate it to the uh, less uh, granular, the uh, the aggregated uh, number of jobs that we get from uh, government sources or uh, NGOs, like uh, there's something called the Labor Force Survey, which conduct uh, surveys on uh, how many employees, let's say per district. So you have the larger unit, which is the district, and you apply the, the its numbers, its aggregate numbers per uh, job category to the less, uh, to the more granular unit, which is the point. So there are 500 employees that work in hospitals in, uh, let's say, the Giza district. We distribute uh, those 500 amongst the hospital points that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, it seems that we have a question from another panelist, Lena. Hi, thank you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to congratulate Abdul Rahman because this is very, very interesting work. And I would like to ask, how do you take into account or do you take into account 
informal work because, uh, for instance, in, in Colombia, in many cities, more than 50% of the people who are working are somehow in the informal sector. And we've had a challenge when mapping accessibility to opportunities, job opportunities, um, in, in, in including informal work. So I wanted to ask that. Yeah, actually, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, we only we are able only to account for informal jobs. We have the number uh, at the uh, aggregate level, so at the district level. So we are only able to add the number of informal jobs at the last uh, step of the analysis. Uh, we are not able to get it at the same level of granularity, uh, neither for Cairo or for uh, example. We are not able to get this uh, same level of granularity for the informal sector. Uh, this is still a challenge that we've We've tried to address that in Cairo by getting, for example, the we have uh, like kiosks, a lot of uh, cigarette kiosks that are that pop up everywhere, and people uh, uh, like it's like self-employment. We managed to get this data by getting the location of the of a POS, a point of sale system, that's installed in each of these kiosks, and we used it as the proxy for this particular activity, but. Uh, it's it's very challenging to get this data at the same granularity as the other uh, employment sectors. Thank you, Akhtar and Lena, for that question. And I, I would add that this question of informal uh, employment and data describing it is sometimes often seen, I think, as a problem of the global south, but is also very important and worth discussing in countries like Canada and the United States. Um, I think we have time for one more audience question. Hi, my name is Sudan Papa. I work with the city of Montreal. I had a question about the IP TVs project. Uh, I was wondering if you noticed that you, you had any concerns um, about the credit that you were giving for new housing. Uh, if they were negative in Python, um, less fortunate uh, neighborhoods, or if people were more rushing towards um, neighborhoods that were already well deserved with services, and if the other ones were kind of left out. Project. Yeah, there's correct. There's a lot of research on that, especially since it became such a big problem in Mexico. But there's a very clear re relationship uh, between um, accessibility to employment, for example, or education and housing abandonment. Uh, we haven't seen, um, you know, the impacts of the new policy because it just became into effect. But we do have um, strong evidence that uh, accessibility is very well related to housing satisfaction. Uh, people were able to stay in their homes, and also there's a relationship to actually the credits being able to be repaid. So there's also a financial aspect in that. But just, I hope I answered the question. Is that a, that a good answer? Great. Thank you so much, Santiago. Um, and thank you for all these questions. Uh, we'll now begin our next sort of mini session um, on collaborative mapping, bicycle data in particular, and equity. Uh, we'll be hearing from, from four speakers, the first of whom, and so two of these will actually be pre-recorded videos, uh, but if you would like to ask questions about these, these are projects that I am also familiar with and I can try to answer those questions. Uh, the first is from my colleague Leonardo Vega uh, in ITDP Brazil's office based in Rio de Janeiro. Hi everyone, my name is Leonardo Vega. I am the monitoring and evaluation coordinator for ITDP Brazil. And today I will talk a little bit about the potation and potations and limits of using open data and collaborative data to calculate indicators uh, in Brazil. Uh, first of all, ITDP uh, is uh, Inter uh, Institute for Transportation Development Policy. It's an international NGO in the sustainable urban mobility area. And here in Brazil, we have a, a platform called Mobilidados. You can search uh, mobilidados.org. It's our platform to compare cities, to compare metropolitan regions, and you use to monitor a public policy in this area. So, today I will talk a little bit about uh, PNB. There are a lot of indicators in, in this website, but PNB may be the, the best one to discuss today. 
can be people near bike lanes. It's the percent of people that lives near uh, a bicycle infrastructure. Uh, when I say near, it's, uh, it's about 300 meters. So to calculate this, we use the bicycle infrastructure and the data, the population data, the geographic population data. Uh, for the, pop the geographic population data, the census track uses data from the Brazil Institute of Geography and Statistics. And it's a very good open data, but here the first problem, it's, it's outdated. So the data that we use, it's from 2010. And the next one will be available maybe this year or the next year. And it's, it's the, the first big problem. But there is a good thing here. Uh, when we use the, the official data from Brazil Institute of Ge Geography, we can disaggregate the, the, the indicator by gender, by race, by income, and there are a lot of options. So it's a good thing. And when you say when we are talking about PNB, the other kind of data that we use is a collaborative data. So we use the data that uh, is created in the OpenStreetMap. But here in Brazil, there is uh, another platform, platform called uh, Ciclomapa that takes the data from the OpenStreetMap and create uh, our topology to show all the bicycle infrastructure. So there are some limits to use this kind of data to create indicators. And the first, of, the first limit is uh, when we are talking about uh, collaborative data, you have to incentivate people to map this kind of infrastructure. So it's the very problem, the very first big problem here in Brazil, because there are a lot of cities that we don't have this kind of person that wants to map by yourself, goes to the open street map to, to map the bicycle infrastructure. And the second one is after we calculate the PNB, there are some people in the public sector that use the PNB and there are another people from public sector that don't use uh, PNB. Uh, those ones that use the PNB, they are incentivated because they are implement a lot of uh, bicycle infrastructure and they are seeing uh, the uh, the indicator rising, so they want to be good at the picture. So, but there are a, a lot, a lot of people from other cities that don't use uh, the PNB as indicator because, uh, as a public sector employee, you have a uh, all bureaucracy that. Uh, doesn't allow you to use this kind of indicator because it's collaborative. But there is a good thing for us that from ATDP Brazil or people that want to use indicator as academic purpose, uh, nowadays you can compare 27 capitals in Brazil. Before that, here in ITDP Brazil, we needed to ask the city halls to give us uh, their shape files with the bicycle infrastructure. So every year we tried and sometimes we get six, seven, eight capitals, uh, eight shape files from capitals. Nowadays it's much more easy to, to do this, to calculate indicator PNB for all cities in Brazil. So. This is the situation in Brazil, and I hope that I have collaborated to this discussion. Bye-bye. To thank Leonardo next time I talk to him on behalf of all of us.
Um, we'll now be seeing another video from our colleague Felipe, um, who's affiliated with the Brazilian Cyclists Union. Um, and they've been working on this application called Ciclomapa that, um, that Leonardo mentioned. Um, and let's take a minute to think about the, the challenges of hosting an international conference like this in North America, in Montreal, and it being much more difficult for people to travel um, from Latin America or Africa or East Asia to be here with us. Hi, everyone. I'm Felipe Alves from Brazil. I'm the coordinator of Ciclomapa and a former director of Brazil Cyclist Union, UCB. Ciclomapa it is this web platform that we created to democratize the access to bike maps. Uh, it was created by two civil society organizations, ITDP Brazil and UCB, because you had this problem that we didn't have uh, any common database with standardized bike maps. So each city in Brazil creates its own map, and these maps doesn't talk uh, really well with each other. Each one has its own language. So we created these platforms that this is the the layout of the platform, you can just choose any Brazilian city and you will see all of the cycling infrastructure. We have these, all, we have here all these uh, cycle lanes, uh, cycle tracks, these bike sharing stations, the bike parking and the bike shops, all distributed in some layers. And we also have on the right panel some indicators that we calculate using this data. This is basically how it works. We have a map box base map that is also a, a open map that it's created with uh, open street map data. And then we take the open street map data of the cycle infrastructure. We choose to use open street map because we didn't want to create a new database, uh, some new data because you already have uh, the possibility to map all the cycling data, all we, we have the possibility to map not just the cycling data, but all the data that we want that has in a city, we can use OpenStreetMap to map it. And then we have this other kind of layer that we, we show some kind of indicators that we use this data to calculate these indicators to the users. Uh, our main task was to translate the data from OpenStreetMap because uh, you have it in OpenStreetMap all these geodata with these tags and values, we had to translate this to a common language, to a language that the, that the cyclists and the other users would understand. They wouldn't understand something in, written in OpenStreetMap language. That it's almost like a code. We had to translate it to to the cycleways, the the, the cycle lanes or the cycle tracks, the the language that the users could understand and could use. And we had a, a great difficulty that the, we have these two great uh, volunteer and collaborative communities. We have the OpenStreetMap community and we have the cycling community. The OpenStreetMap community does a, does a lot of uh, free and voluntary uh, mapping tasks and all these kinds of uh, mapping. Uh, they do it for free, but they usually they are more interested in car infrastructure or in buildings or in something else, not a uh, cycle infrastructure. So they don't usually map with the, with many care, the cycle infrastructures. And you have these other, the, the, the other community, the cycling community that they also do a lot of activism, advocacy. They do a great work, but usually they are not so uh, interested or they don't comprehend so well the open street map. So uh, we, we have the, this problem with, uh, we couldn't get the cycling community to map because they don't understand or they don't, they are not interested in OpenStreetMap and the OpenStreetMap community that does understand it's not so interested in cycling infrastructure. So we created these tutorials in YouTube, the, these are only in Portuguese, to how to map cycling infrastructure. We also explain a little bit of what is each kind of cycling infrastructure for people who are not uh, we're not used to see these definitions. 
and we, we explain the definitions, the OpenStreetMap definition, the OpenStreetMap language, and the process of how to map each one of these infrastructures. So we create these tutorials. We usually talk a lot uh, in many kind of events to try to get more people to collaborate, to map. And we also had a free course uh, last year we had the first uh, the first class and this year probably we'll have another one with a free course for people how to map for for people how to understand OpenStreetMap how understand how it works and how to map the cycle infrastructures. So this is how we're trying to get more people to map because we, we already have this the Ciclo Mapa this platform that shows the cycle infrastructure for any Brazilian city getting data from OpenStreetMap, but but for many cities we don't have so many data. So this is how we try to solve this problem to getting more people to to collaborate to map the cycling infrastructure. So this is the link to the website ciclomapa.org.br, and we have, we also have the, all this code in the in our GitHub, and this is the 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 other link. It's is from the web page that has the tutorials and some other materials and this is also an email that you can contact us if you want so i think that's it thank you very much have a great event and a great discussion well thank you um again asynchronously to um to our colleagues felipe and leonardo um and i think you know, we're, we're seeing how data can, OpenStreetMap data especially, can be used to calculate these indicators of people near bikeways, of equity, um, and then also be displayed in this really compelling format for cities around at least Brazil, if not the world. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about how this data is actually collected and the community process of, of crowdsourcing this, this mapping effort. And for that, we'll be hearing from Natalia Aruda, um, I believe in Colombia at the moment, uh, but also a PhD candidate at Arizona State University. Great. So, hi everyone. I'm glad to be here with you today and present you CGMBC. CGMBC is a collaborative mapping, uh, cycling infrastructure mapping project supported by the use of free and open source softwares and to generate open data. It was a project that arised from the collaboration between Hell Lab, the research group that I was part when I was working in Universidad de Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia, as Taylor mentioned. Right now, I am uh, doing my PhD in urban planning at Arizona State University. And so CGMBC was a collaboration between Hell Lab and Corporación Colectivo Ciclas, a cyclist group from the city of Medellin. And in CGMBC, we propose to expand the information of the existing cycling infrastructure on OpenStreetMap that you notice was, uh, was not completed. And in order to encourage more people to use bicycles as a mode of urban transportation, some of our main objectives were to conduct remote and field data collection survey the cyclist community to understand their preference, their behaviors, and develop, develop a spatial analysis to then share this with the broader community and planning entities. So we based the development of uh, CGMBC in the participation. We engaged the cycling community since the first uh, phase of the project. We conduct workshops using OpenStreetMap and its editors and explained uh, the process to empower the community to use these tools, inviting them to become active mappers, using their local knowledge in, to construct this collaborative data. And as a result of this, we had all the bicycle lanes in, in cycling amenities published on OpenStreetMap as also on our webpage that you can see here in this slide. And we also trained volunteers to capture local street level using Mapillary app. Uh, app. And um, it was very important for us to engage them because the cyclist community is growing locally and they are a key role uh, they play a key role in the generation and use of open data in the field of mobility. And by strengthening this technological connectivity, we believe we, they can become active mappers who have uh, local knowledge and the interest to keep this data constantly updated. 
So in the first phase for the remote mapping, we defined a list of tagging elements and uh, we try to match together uh, tags or labels related to cycle, cycle lanes, and also cycle facilities related like bike parking, uh, repair shops, bike stations, among others. And you realize that the terminology used to refer to all this infrastructure uh, is not standardized. It can change even in the same region. So we notice the need to create, like uh, establish a data mapping standard in order to have more information in a consistent and uniform way as possible. So we organize a step-by-step -step guide and we socialize this with the community. And now CGMBC is collaborating with ITDP and OS and OpenStreetMap community in a pilot project to standardize a tag scheme proposal for cycle whale protection in OpenStreetMap. So, this data that I'm showing you is the data that we collect after two months of publishing and sharing the survey with the cycling community and we received a huge participation. We uh, were able to reach like the equivalent of 72% of the official survey from the metropolitan area of Medellin, the last one from 2017. And uh, concerning gender, we had 36% uh, of female or women participation, 62% of men participation. And um, even if we think it's a low participation of women, this was three times three time higher than the official survey collected. And the gender option other was just 1%. Uh, so we observed that the majority of women choose to follow, when we analyze their roots, we preserve that women choose to follow bicycle paths and not so much shared lanes. They prefer to avoid high traffic roads, contrary to the behavior of the men. Men prefer more, uh, men use more alternative routes for their commutes uh, and they commute more spreadly in their territory. And um, women also perceive themselves less experienced in cycling than men, even if this is not proportionally related to the time they have been cyclists. So this is some of the data that we collected that I found it was interesting to share with you. And uh, we also face a lot of barriers, especially because we started this project and right the pandemic, uh, and then the pandemic started to close everything. And um, so, First, we notice that we need to recognize, we need to involve, to engage more female and let uh, LGBTIQ plus community to represent more their reality. And also, uh, as I mentioned, as we had to migrate many of our activities to the virtual environment, we are able to notice this digital divide that exists in our community because we have danced that uh, we received very, very little information from some of the most vulnerable areas in from Medellin. And uh, also we noticed this relationship with uh, regarding the educational level because we received more answers from people from higher educational levels than the population of cyclists in Medellin. Uh, so we noticed this. And also we, um, we saw, we noticed the need to generate more literacy space on special issues. So as to increase community participation in many of the digital initiatives that can involve spatial data, which are becoming more and more common, especially on issues of city planning to facilitate citizen participation in urban mobility planning. And um, just to close, I want to share with you that you, through this project, through CGMBC, we really notice that we need more available and up-to-date really, and, really, and reliable information about existence of location and condition of bicycle lanes, bicycle shares, of all the inf cycling infrastructure. And uh, we need incentives to use the technologies for decision making of this kind of information, because as this information can be a really good uh, tool to connect people uh, with the, the information about on, the, on their territory and help them to decide that they can migrate from an, a car to a bike, for instance, the absence of this, this data can also represent a big barrier for their individual decisions. 
thank you so much. And I am open to listen and try to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, we'll have just one panelist left uh, before we have time for audience questions. And wrapping us up for the morning is Lina Quinones at Despacio, which is a Bogota-based um, sustainable mobility advocacy group. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Taylor. Um, uh, I just want to confirm that everyone uh, can see my screen. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Lina Quinones. I, I work for an, an NGO called Despacio in Bogota, Colombia, uh, which uh, focus on uh, improving livability in cities. And I have also worked before with uh, the government in Bogota, specifically as head of the uh, data analysis department within the transport department. So I wanted to close with uh, some reflections on the needs and opportunities we have uh, for data specifically aimed at this data turn into actual uh, policy. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's worth mentioning, and I, I believe Santiago mentioned this, that uh, data collection methods and KPIs are still focused on motorized transport. So for instance, one of the, um, uh, of the indicators that we measure often is traffic volumes. And while this has uh, been applied to, for example, uh, cyclist volumes, it is uh, difficult to translate it into, for example, measuring pedestrians because pedestrians are more erratic. They move freely uh, throughout the, the streets and the sidewalks. And so um, the, the methods that we have designed for measuring uh, traffic volumes and motorized vehicles do not translate as well when we are trying to measure more sustainable and desirable um, mobility options such as walking and even sometimes cycling. So uh, we also have to take a step back and start thinking on how are we designing our indicators and what are we prioritizing when we design our, our KPIs in, in cities. Um, a lot of the, the technologies that have been developed for cities to use are also very much focused on motorized transport. And for example, uh, another of the, of the key indicators that cities often measure and report on is uh, traffic speeds. And these speeds are basically centered on uh, private cars or mixed lanes. And for example, do not take into account or um, do not communicate how speeds change when uh, people are moving by biking or for example, in the case of Bogota by BRT. So you see on Google Maps on ways, uh, how are the speeds on the main corridors, but they don't tell you how that speed changes if you take the BRT instead of using uh, your car. So again, these uh, KPIs and uh, collection methods are still very much focused on motorized transport, even though people in the government or um, and different NGOs recognize the need to measure and report on other modes of transport, we still have uh, a lot uh, there left to, to do. And I also wanted to um, highlight that this goes beyond new technologies. Uh, so we have seen some fantastic examples of how new technologies and new data collection methods have been used uh, to, to try and shift these measures that I have mentioned that are still very much focused on motorized transport and shift them towards more uh, sustainable and equitable modes of transport, more efficient modes of transport. But uh, there's also a legal barrier here for governments to actually adopt these technologies and it's something we have to take into account. Um, in the case of Colombia, which has, uh, I'm sorry to say, a very bureaucratic uh, government structure, uh, you have to justify very, very well the need to change or to adapt or to invest in one of these new methods. And if, uh, for example, they, you have to um, you have to ensure that the result is statistically significant uh, if you want to change for from a traditional survey to say collaborative mapping, or uh, you have to ensure that these new data collection methods will render some results in the short term. And sometimes, again, while government officials recognize that it is important to shift to these new methods and they can provide very valuable information, they are unwilling to invest in these because they might get into trouble. Uh, so it's also uh, a 
a really important thing to remember and to take into account that it's not just willingness from part of um, from government official and it's not just um, having these new methods, but there's also a legal barrier that we have to take into account and work towards having, um, say, government systems that are where it is easier to implement uh, innovation and new and new, um, data collection methods. Uh, I also wanted to zoom on, uh, zoom in on these data collection methods. And actually, I was very happy to see that both the uh, example from Cairo and Casablanca and uh, Santiago's examples from Mexico are very much focused on this and is um, highlighting access and equity. So we, we moved from uh, measuring traffic to measuring mobility, and now we are focusing on access and accessibility, which I believe is very important. And particularly the last two years have shown us that you don't have to move or to travel to actually have good access to some jobs and other opportunities as, such as shopping or leisure. Um, again, we are all here uh, connecting from different continents and, and we can still have a discussion. So that's very important. And um, these new data collection methods that we've been um, talking about today, such as collaborative mapping, or for example, uh, mobile, and mobile phone data, provide a new opportunity, which is a data gap that we have um, that we have had with our traditional methods, and is that we uh, measure a lot of people who travel and how do they travel and what do they travel, why do they travel, but we have no idea about why people may not travel. So we never take into account people who stay at home. We don't know if they're doing this because they have good access. For example, they are working from home and they do not need to travel to access job opportunities, or maybe just simply they don't have uh, enough money to actually go out of their house and, and get into a bus or any uh, form of public transport. Uh, or maybe, for example, they can't go out of their home because sidewalks are in such a bad state that they can't really just leave because they have the um, they're differently able. So we really not, do not have any kind of information about why people might not be traveling. We always focus on people who leave their homes. And these new, um, these new uh, methods and tools can actually help us with that, starting, to start, starting mapping out how or where are these people who are not traveling and if we see patterns. So there's a big opportunity on there. And uh, I wanted to also comment on something that Natalia mentioned, and it's the gender gap and the lack of a representation or gap, you know, representation gap we have in uh, a new methods such as collaborative mapping, or again, uh, when we move towards uh, different technologies such as apps or mobile, or mobile phone data, sometimes we lose a lot of information on who is traveling. So the traditional mobility surveys, and then I highlight Bogota's mobility survey in particular, have very good information on gender and identity and also uh, levels of income and all these social demographic conditions that shape very much how we travel and why we make certain decisions. And we need to make sure that we do not lose this level of analysis if we are moving towards uh, new technologies and a cheaper um, data collection methods. So it's important to still have uh, take that into account and find a way where we can still add these levels of analysis because it is very important to have information that is disaggregated by social demographic conditions and identity markers. And uh, a final thing that I wanted to highlight again, and this is, uh, uh, this is a very uh, quite recent initiative by Bogota is uh, to have open data available for everyone. So we have talked quite a bit about GTFS and we also have the MDS standard for micromobility. And um, we have very good examples from cities all over the world that have made uh, large data sets available for anyone and that have made APIs available for say programmers to include on, in their in their developments in their apps and this is fantastic but we also have to take into account that most of the citizens <laughs> are not data scientists are not programmers and we also have to make sure that data is available for them um, so Bogota has um, 
published their uh, mobility observatory, which the link is, is here on the bottom um, right corner. And uh, this is a portal where anyone uh, can check and consult uh, key indicators for uh, how well, uh, it, for mobility in the city, we have um, data on um, road safety, road crashes, and patterns of mobility on, on uh, taxis, uh, bicycles, uh, the, the vehicle uh, park. And so it is very important because uh, students or journalists or people who do not have this very quantitative formation and like, or they just don't want to spend uh, a lot of time in uh, analyzing data to get an indicator that they need to include in a, say, a press note. They can go in and check and it's, they can actually apply like they can uh, they can control the government or like request accountability from the government but being informed with actual official data and for example anyone in the city can uh, check how our um, road crash is behaving and if they have increased in the last months or they have uh, decreased so if, if they have increased they can uh, go to the government and say like what is happening here but they have official data and it's again it's attractive it's easy to consult you can filter a little bit you cannot do well very um very advanced data analysis or uh, cross variables but it is very important to have this level of open data as well, not just like the large data sets and APIs, but also having information that is easy to understand and is accessible for everyone and just uh, anyone can consult it. So those are my final reflections for today. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you uh, to everyone else who spoke today. Uh, I saw very interesting um, projects and results and I handle back the floor to you, Taylor. Thank you so much, Lina, and thanks also, of course, to Natalia, Leo, Felipe, and Santiago, and Daniel. So, Anne was asking about uh, the people near bikeways, the PND indicator, um, and how you know it, it measures only the number of people who live within a short distance of bikeways. It does not measure their actual use of the bikeways. And so, have we been looking into access metrics, uh, building on people near bikeways, um, and in what other ways do we address that issue? Um, and because uh, Leonardo is not live today, um, I can try to respond to the question as I can. So we see the advantage of people near bikeways as being a very simple indicator, when it's very easy to communicate the percentage of the city population within 300 meters of protected bike. Um, and this is very easy for people who are not transport specialists to understand, whereas the access to destination indicators can get a little bit more technically demanding and a little bit more complexly play. Um, and so we often try to introduce this indicator first, sort of help cities embed it as a goal in ITV's cycling cities campaign. We're actually helping 28 cities around the world bring um, like 25 million more people within a short distance of bike lanes in the next couple of years. Um, but in principle, yes, access measurements are much more meaningful, and that's why we're so excited about the work that um, Abdul Rahman and Daniel and Santiago are doing to improve those measurements. So let me see if I can parrot this question correctly. Um, so the, the question is, in talking about uh, accessibility indicators, uh, this is sort of the, the way we can talk about it is on the supply side, um, and Often in the context where we're working, there's only population data, if even that, and there aren't really good data on um, incomes or sort of origin destination matrices or anything like that. So what are the sources of data that you use to sort of characterize the demand for transport services or infrastructure opportunities? Um, is that about right? I'd love to hear whether Santi or Abdul Rahman has to say about this. Sure, I can. I can maybe try to answer that. Um, it's definitely a challenge. 
Um, locally, there's now very interesting data sets, especially on population, for example, that use satellite imagery to sort of estimate population. We've been exploring using that, and it's very, it's very valuable because you can at least have a picture of how things look in very data scarce environments, such as even um, very isolated African cities or cities in Latin America where we have like really no data. So there's these new um, data sources that sort of give us, you know, an idea of how, how where people are. And since OpenStreetMap is also um, very easy to map, we can calculate some indicators just using that. Um, other, other data sources that we also need to, to take into account is, for example, new um, mobile phone data. It's very interesting because it's now mobile phones are now reaching a very a wider you know, spectrum of the population. Now it's not so related to income. Now almost everybody has a phone. And that gives us a very good idea of where people are, where people are going. And um, even if that data is hard to access, there's now some ways in which partnerships are happening, in which we can at least know a little bit, no? Um, but it's definitely a challenge and something that we need to improve. Great. Thank you, Santiago. Um, Natalia, yes. Yeah, I would add something, even if in CGBC, the project that I presented, we focus on cycling infrastructure and we are not, it was not in our objectives specifically and directly uh, work on accessibility index. We uh, consider that cycle lanes and cycle paths, uh, in however it is called in your region or city, um, they should be considered and, and added to this idea of how accessibility can be improved. It's not just the station, you know, you can come in a BRT system, on a metro system, and then uh, it's not just the area of influence of this, of this station that should be counted and how, how much you can uh, have people living there and working there. People are also traveling using bikes and cycling infrastructure can to stretch this area of influence because people can use bike to arrive to, to a metro station or a BRT station and continue their, their trip using multimodes, right? So, um, and even if in Medellin, we had also, we have also good database as Marce Lina Marcella showed for Bogota in Medellin, the official uh, government have has also this um, database and everyone can access it. The cyclic, cyclist community felt that there was missing information regarding the final level of it from where to point B to B, but which route they are they using? We don't know if they really, the cyclists prefer uh, routes that have traf high traffic uh, volumes, but are more directly or prefer residential roads, uh, uh, residential roads because they have less traffic volume, volume and they will be less directed. We don't understand yet very well how cyclists do this, uh, how cyclists do those choices, right? So this is one that we will try to understand better sticking and this and then it and I believe that this can help a lot to understand how accessibility can be improved and uh, how you can connect multi multi modes uh, in order to to give better index great thank you so much Natalia um, I was hoping we'd have time for one more question but I think that I don't want to keep you all from lunch, and I don't want to keep our friends in other cities from their other plans. I know that it's quite late in, in Cairo right now, so I really want to especially thank Abdul Rahman for being here. Um, thank you again once more to Mobility Data and Elizabeth in particular uh, for hosting, and thanks to all of you. I wanted to say one more thing, which is that I'd like to announce um, ongoing work at ITDP to build on what we've learned from all of our partners here and assemble a global atlas of these kinds of indicators, indicators like people near bikeways or people near transit, access to destinations, land use. Um, and we're hoping for this to come out later next fall for, city, for cities all around the world, ideally every city all around the world. Um, if you'd like to hear more about this, 
Or if you'd like to hear about the, the really terrific work going on at CAF and at WRI, there will be a panel um, especially on informal transit data tomorrow afternoon. I think it's one of the last sessions of the day. Um, and they'll both be speaking, Hayne and Catalina. Um, so thank you again so much for, for coming today. Unfortunately, because our panelists are not here in person, they're not able to meet you in person right now, but I wanted to facilitate some connection between you all, so I put up this little um, whiteboard here. If you'd like, put your email down here, and then I'll send out an email later in the week introducing all of you to the panelists so that you can continue the conversation, because there is so much to discuss and there is so much to be done. So thank you so much all for being here, and just another word from Elizabeth. So a uh, great applause to Taylor and all the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like I want to continue that discussion. Uh, obviously, it's not enough. It's only a, a small, tiny beginning that we have today. Um, thanks again. It was very rich. Uh, um, now it is time uh, for the lunch time. Uh, um, just also to let you know, this afternoon in this room, again, I will be hosting a session that is called Some Do Not Like It Hot. Uh, um, leveraging data standards for mode shift and climate change. Um, so if you want to be part of a, a discussion on data and policy with me, it will be a pleasure. Otherwise, it was great to see a full room and you say all the session. Uh, um, I totally understand. They were really uh, fantastic. Uh, so thanks again and I uh, wish you a great lunch. <laughs>